my exams are always a shock. Um, I don't know, some students really struggle. Um, the average was a little lower than average than my normal, about five points. So what I offer, I had to do this for this exam last year. I don't curve. So what you can do is on, you can redo one question to get up to 80, or you can pick two to get up to 70. That's, that's all you can do. So you have to pick and choose between those two. Uh, but you got to tell me what you're going to do in advance. So like if you got 20% on two of them, you probably want to do two to get 70. If you got 80s and 90s on three of them, you got a 20 on one, you probably want to do that for 80. All right? Everybody understand that? So you got to do it. You got to, you got to coordinate it with me somehow because a Christine... Spring break's coming up and it's going to get complicated. So, any questions on that? Oh, sorry. All right. I won't do the soapbox I did in my previous class. You can watch that class if you want to get my soapbox. All right, let me check attendance real quick. So Jorge, Jacob, Adrian, Lindy, Hannah, Sonny, Ryan, Kimti, Jacob, Ricky. Oh, Jacob. Got another Jacob here. Win Win, Christina, Darian. Brendan, Mitchell, Jennifer, Corey, Nathan. All right. Hands on line. All right. So what I'm gonna do tonight, finish up auto. Once that gets up and running. <clears throat> Finish up autos, a few topics to finish on auto. We might start commercial on, on Thursday. We'll get out a little early on Thursday because there's a video I want you to watch related to auto insurance that I'll send you a link to, which is about 30 minutes. So we'll, we'll, we'll adjust for that. Oh, I gotta wait for the system to come up. Any questions or anything? Huh? If it's the essays, you're going to essentially just resubmit them on Blackboard. Okay. If you resubmit and you change one or two paragraphs, make sure you highlight what you change. And if it's, it's the math, question. If it's a math you got to tell me because I have to write a new question. Okay. Now, there was an error in the math, and no one told me about it, but I had the years off. I don't know if y'all noticed that. So there was like four different. There's like four or five different ways you can do it. So if you did it one of those ways, kind of bug me, no one told me because the question doesn't make any sense like that. So I'm not sure. No, no, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't work that way. But I, you know, some did with three and four, some did three and three. Huh? Was that number one? Yeah, the very first one. Right. I just did, you gave me the, the numbers and I just put it. Yeah, but it, the way I set it up doesn't make sense because, um, I, I mean, it's it just the way I explained it when I first set it up is the reason I do that is because it reduces all the risk. Because if you have to sell a bond before maturity, you don't know if you have a gain or loss. Remember, this can have no losses, everything has to line up perfectly. And I just didn't change that one year. So, but it, you know, I didn't cost you points. In fact, probably anything, it probably helped you a little bit. It made it really tough for me to grade it. I love grading questions where the answer is exactly right because I can grade it much faster. So I essentially had to set up the, the exam question like four times in my Excel, depending on how you did it, so I could figure out the answer. So, all right, I want to do a couple of videos tonight because auto insurance to me is really interesting. This would be a great paper two topic. So the Institute of Highway Safety, they do really good analysis on things like airbags and SUV weights 
and distracted drivers, um, seat belts. So a great paper topic no one's ever done, I think are really, really interesting would be uh, the impact of the Institute of Highway Safety on car manufacturing and insurance rates. They did a study, we're gonna talk a little bit about it tonight about the turnarounds. Uh, and you could probably do a whole thing on that. So you probably can do a whole paper on just seat belts, but if you put them all in there and go back to the history, you'll find that, and I don't know if the Institute, how long they've existed. So the seat belt was really Ralph Nader. He's the one that really pushed seat belts, but definitely involved in side airbags. And that's what the video I want you to watch. It's called the Phys physics of auto of driving. The difference between driving 50 miles an hour and driving 60 miles an hour and what the math behind that is it's really interesting video but this is one that I, I think is really interesting a lot of people say today cars are made out of aluminum they're lighter they're not tough like the cars in the 50s were so how would you think a chevy malibu 2009 would do against a 1959 much heavier much more still which car would you rather have a front end collision in? Any votes? The newer one, you think they're safer? Everybody agree with that? How much safer and why? When I watch these videos, it influences what kind of car I want to buy. Let's look at it. Let's get some volume here. Just a second. Um, so you may not get that problem because I need to buy Let's try that. Okay. I'm pick up on the uh, video on that. Both pretty messed up, aren't they? What's the heads? That's there's two things I watch in here. I watch the heads and I watch the legs. There's some of these that are where you'll live, but your legs are going to be so mangled because one thing you're worried about is the front. Where's the front part of that car going? You want as much protection there. You want the thing to you want it to collapse. The problem is when it doesn't collapse. What happens when it doesn't collapse? You've got an engine in your lap. You actually want it to crunch and crash. What said you want to be yours? I mean, I didn't tell you no airbag, no sleep belts. That makes a big difference. Yeah. He's probably have some whiplash. Probably going to be a little injured. Probably going to feel good tomorrow, but he's going to walk out of that car. I don't know if he's going to walk out. So 50 years, seatbelts were ruling the 60s, so but this was made in 2010. So they, they may have been around for seatbelts. That might have been their first real big thing. Maybe they would have created an institute. Highway Safety is a trade group that supports the insurance industry. 
but they do. They are they are highly respected. They have many many videos out there, so you can look at the videos. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about distracted driving here a little bit. But, Safety information. Subscribe. Websites in here. That's consumer reports, but the website for Institute of Highway Safety. You can go to their website. A lot of, lot of good research. I would find it to be a really interesting paper. So I hope someone might think about doing that. Um, and certainly, if you're interviewing with an insurance company on the auto side, the fact that you're looking at that and researching that and understanding that. Because what is this going to do to insurance rates? It's going to be pretty big on insurance rates as well. Because, you know, whether or not you walk away from this ride, uh, especially if you have a wreck with the other car, the insurance industry wants to make both your car, both, make sure both cars are not going to cause major damage to people. Right? This is that false positive discussion. What if there are good drivers with bad credit scores, or good drivers who just can't find insurance? So how would telematics, it'd be interesting if, if Crystal had telematics on the card to see why it would actually be important for her. Let's talk a little bit about telematics. It's, it, is, it is changing the industry somewhat. Um, track driving habits are changing the face of car insurance. So this could be your paper on telematics. I think there's enough articles out there now. I think especially if you, we talked about this before, route insurance, I think we looked at it before, but um, that's their big thing. Um, so it, there are certainly a lot of firms that are doing that. Uh, most people say they're above average driver. Uh, we're using things like age, location, gender. Uh, we want to get you know, boy drivers off the road. We got crystals and drivers, so, you know. It's but on average, boys are worse drivers than girls. Men are worse drivers than women. Um, by monitoring customers, monitor, uh, monitoring their customers' motoring habits, underwriters can increasingly distinguish between drivers who are safe on the road from those who are safe on paper. Automatics insurance will become the industry norm. So this article is a little bit dated, it's about eight years old, so has it become the industry norm? Most variants this model rely on a simple device in the car that brings back data to the insurance company. In America, the focus is on how much the car spends on the road. In Europe, Britain, Italy, the field has simply emphasized driver ability. Some devices include location tracking that can figure out if, say, a car is over 80 and a 50. That would be pretty interesting. People that speed cause an enormous number of accidents in the United States, so that would be good information. Um, the prospective customer discounts can be 10 to 40 percent. That's real similar to what we saw with credit scores. So it's possible the credit score raises your rate 40 percent. If you're a good driver, you can reduce it. Or if you're a bad driver, you just become a good driver because you have the telematics. You can reduce it. You just change your behavior. Uh, the drivers most likely to benefit are those in the standard market for overpricing other age and other factors. Last month, the firm asked drive like the world. I don't really think this is a really would be too successful. The campaign, not let me know, but it's drive like a girl. The spur was a recent EU court ruling that bars insurers from discriminating on the basis of sex. This forces young women to pay more. With telematics, however, women are can demonstrate that they really are safe drivers. So this is one way to get around the gender rules and say you can't charge men more than women. Let's say, yeah, but telematics proves that I'm a driver. So, um, I don't know. If, this, if you were a teenage boy, would this campaign work with you? You don't need to be a girl to drive like one. Is that like, wow, this is going to change my driving behavior? I think that'd be insulting to women and, and guys. I don't know. That's what they brought in Europe. The rewards can be greater for companies, they can cherry pick their customers based on data. And they're probably not going to get as much pushback on this as they do on credit scores. Most people will say, hey, you know what? You're using actual data on my actual driving. What, how can I complain about that? Um, this is a huge advantage. The firm says a third of new business comes via telematics. That's pretty important. I wonder if that's progressive. That's a large insurance company. They're probably about 5 6% of the market. I haven't noticed it in their commercials, but I don't have TV. 
so I don't see the commercials as much. Um, but I noticed that advertising first as a third new business comes with telematics, the hefty discount offers the best drivers will still leaves it plenty of margin. It avoids ensuring the extensive car records of the future by granting miles of drivers no rebate and not use them to buy insurance elsewhere. Now that's really interesting because I don't know if y'all know the history of progressive. But progressive started off as a substandard insurer. In fact, USA did business with Progressive. That's where USA sent its worst drivers. So they've changed that. They've changed that background, and they're now, you know, kind of poor. Some of y'all might have Progressive insurance. And it's an interesting company. Strange company. Their commercials are pretty strange. I think they still have that lady on there. I don't think it's hard. I remember the game report several years ago. I don't really know to recommend. At it, but the entire thing was different parts of a naked man's body. That's what they had. This guy, like 60 years old, they were taking pictures of his armpit and his right eye, and it, nothing illicit, but still pretty grotesque. But this is a strange company. They try to make themselves look a little bit stranger and different. I don't know why, what the culture is. But here they're actually trying to get good drivers and get good and bad drivers, the exact opposite of how they started. Um, a side benefit ensures can easily identify identity scams. If, if a costly whip loss claim is submitted for what was in fact a small bump, this has driven growth in the Italian market. Um, you know, so that's that's pretty good. You know, hey, whip loss while you're going 15 miles an hour, it's not very likely that you got whip loss. Telematics is a way to improve driver standards, driving standards by making drivers more this can be made a beat when a car breaks too heavily, for example. Now, my car does a lot of this already, so I, I was really shocked when I got my latest car. It's a Prius Prime. It's telling me something. Hey, you're not in, you're not in your lane. You need to brake. The brake thing scared me to death. The first time I saw it, I said, brake. I said, come on. And I've seen it before. I almost had a wreck because my car was telling me to brake. Um, so telematics is kind of being built in just from cars already. Like, I'm getting sick and tired of my car telling me, so customers and regulars also worry about privacy. Progressive no longer monitors cars' locations. It, it's Gizmo's only safe plug in for six months to establish a snapshot. Despite, despite such concerns, the market growing quickly. Customers like personalized discounts and, and insurers crave that kind of data. So you have an entire company that is based just on this one thing. You can see it right there, and you can advertise it. Your score. And my, my car gives me a score, but it's based on energy usage, which kind of irritates me that it does that, but it tells me, hey, you could have had the air conditioner at a slightly higher temperature, uh, you could have uh, had more reliable speed. But here they're giving you a score. Nine out of ten sounds pretty good. Uh, so you know I'm tempted I still in the telematics. I'm tempted just to give me Certainly do a case on this, and actually, since we have, you know, we probably have contacts in this industry, or you know, you probably find it's a new company, and there's a podcast that Ruth is a guest, and it's an actual podcast, an actual student. This might be a really good paper to do. You can listen to that podcast, get some articles in telematics, and just listen to them. It's a really interesting podcast. Plus, they sound like really friendly people. So my guess is. You could probably email the guy on the podcast and say, I'm writing a paper for this class. Would you be willing to talk to me? So many companies would. So, you know, branch out on paper too, since I'm giving you so much liberty, branch out in a way that you have something really cool to talk about in there that separates you from the pack. You're really good way to take advantage of the second paper since I'm not dictating to you the, the topic. Um, so, telematics, important new uh, development. What about companies that just don't do it? They say, we don't want to do credit scores. We don't want telematics. So you've got a good company. Let's say, you know, single to married drivers. That's not fair to the single drivers. Why should they have to pay more just because they're not married? If they're going to charge them all the same. Remember the pure premium. That's the part of the premium that will exactly cover the claims. That should be 500 bucks. So this is going to charge everybody 500 bucks. This company, they call themselves Evil. Uh, they showed that the pure premium for married drivers is 300. 
the premium for single drivers is seven fifty. So here's these two companies. You tell me what's going to happen. Single driver is going to be more. They're going to go to the company. They're going to pay five hundred plus expenses and profit, and their average claim is going to be seven fifty. Be pretty disastrous. What are married people going to do? They're going to go to evil company. They're going to pay 300 plus expenses and profit. Their claims are going to be 300. The evil company is like, yeah, that's exactly what we wanted. Over time, what's the good company going to have to do? All of their customers have average claims of 750. They're charging 500. They're going to raise the rates. They're going to raise. What are they going to raise the rates to? Probably more than 750. That's going to make up for all those losses. Then all the single drivers are going to then go to the evil company and pay 750 instead of 800. There is no way for the big company to stay in business. Same thing with credit scores. If one company charges for credit scores and one doesn't, and there's a 40% difference, people with good credit scores can go to that company, people with bad credit scores can go to the company that doesn't distinguish between the two. It's inevitable. The only way the good company can survive is they have offsetting things that they charge for the other or if this is immaterial. But if this is material, they have no choice but to make those those distinguish uh, those great differences. So all good drive, all single drivers go to the good company. They're going to see huge losses. All married people are going to go to evil company. They're going to get exactly what they want. The only way for insurers to stop using credit scores is the state makes it be like California. It's the only way it's going to work. And who wins in that case? People with bad credit scores, people with good credit scores, don't forget that people with good credit scores, they lose. Women in Europe are losing because they cannot charge men and women different things. They're winning on the annuity side, but they're losing on auto insurance, losing on um, life, um, um, life insurance. They're getting ahead on health insurance and annuities, but they're losing on the other two. Who knows? We talked about that in our life insurance class, right? Now, you know, on that. What would they come out? Who knows? So, the new law that forbids discrimination has to say um, no company can do it. Now, if telematics discovers that it, it tells you everything the credit scores tell you, insurance companies will stop using credit scores because it's, they don't like it. It gives them a bad name, a bad rap. It does set up these redlining type of issues that they have. Um, I don't know if it would point that telematics exactly offsets credit scores. That would be an interesting thing to so figure out. Uh, I'm sure the actuaries at USA could tell us something. Like that. I'm sure they've studied that. One of the students that was in this class, that was her job at USA, was to study telematics and figure out if USA could cut their rates because of telematics. At the time, she said they didn't, but my guess is they must be now because competitors are doing it. And they have no choice. If telematics is making a difference, then I'm going to go to a group and get a cheaper rate because if I'm a better driver. If I find I'm a worse driver for a while, stay with you as an aider. So it's over time they're going to have to do that. We saw that one already. And here's the Institute of Highway Safety. This is showing what they have. I'm going to show it to you before. Great, great, great um, article ideas. You look at ratings, you can look at your vehicle topics. Advanced driver assist, assistance. So, is that good or bad that our cars are talking to us so much? Does that make us safer or not? We're going to study that and see. I, I was, you know, one thing I was really amazed with because I didn't know it was on my car was the cruise control. My car shifts speeds. Does your car do that? I had no idea. Oh, yeah. I, I, I didn't. I was like, why is my car slowing down? But it was keeping me equal distance. I was like, well, that's kind of cool. My fear is that I'm going to become so complacent that I'm just going to assume that it's what I discovered is when I have that on, my feet are not in the right position. If I need to put the brake on, I'm like, wait, where are my feet? So I'm, I have now this thought, where is my right foot? Yeah, where is my right foot so I can put it if it's like trapped underneath the, the brake? So I've, I've you know, discovered, yeah, there's some things that are kind of dangerous there. 
airbags, obviously, but now the big thing is the side airbags. And that's one thing, you know, Highway Institute, what they discovered is there's been so much test on these front end collisions. What they discovered makes a big difference where the front end is. So the off center front end is much different than this front end. And then the side, the side, any of y'all have side airbags? Does it make you feel safer? Yeah. It's, uh, my, I don't think mine does. If it does, I don't they didn't tell me about it. Alcohol and drug use, what impact does that have? Obviously, that's, that's a big issue. Uh, child safety seats, that's an irritant. Why I tell you, you almost don't have kids anymore just because of this, the safety seats. I've seen somebody go, I love that SNL skit where what's his name is putting a kid so mad and it's, it's hilarious. Uh, distracted driving, that to me could be a paper by itself. You just saw Crystal and her distracted driving. It's amazing. They've had several on that kind of use where driver that are mostly young people. I know old people are texting as well. Young people that just refuse to stop texting. I've gotten to the point where I just put my phone on airplane mode and sit it down and I'm not looking at it. It's completely out of sight. I'm not going to let it distract me. Um, the fatality statistics are actually pretty interesting. You would have thought during COVID, what would happen to fatality during COVID? So what happened in COVID? You stopped driving. So frequency came down dramatically. What is the area? People went up. Why is it? Because these young drivers were no longer just about traffic. So actually, the death rate per accident went up. Even though the number of accidents went down, so fatality. Headlights, we've, we've had a lot of a lot of uh, research on headlights, the type of headlights, the brightness of them, those kind of things. Uh, trucks, motorcycles, older drivers. USA tried this thing and it didn't work. It was interesting. They told older drivers, stop driving. We'll take your savings on insurance and we'll buy you a tube of life. And it didn't work. Same with my mom, we took the keys away. She was okay with this. She complained about it a little bit, but she was okay with it. We were so worried because of her, her dementia that she's going to drive somewhere not know where she was, or actually put we we're worried, you know, putting other people at risk. Um, pedestrians and bicycles, red light running, you know, that's kind of the one thing I'm talking about there. That's the most dangerous thing. So there you have it right there, roundabouts. They probably have statistics on how safe they are. Are safer, a safer alternative traffic signals and stop signs. The lot the tight circle of a roundabout forces drivers to slow down, and the most severe types of intersect crashes, right angles, left turn. You saw those, right? Going right in the side of them, head on collisions are unlikely. Roundabouts improve traffic flow and better for the environment. Research shows that traffic, I mean, one thing is really nice about them is, you know, I was, uh, UTSA was. It's so you know, I'm getting irritated that we have three lights go go west and six and four. The nice thing about a round lot, if you're at 10 o'clock at night and there's no traffic, you just keep going. You don't have to sit there and see the light for so forever. So it, it forever. So it does help with traffic flow. Improves 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 after traditional intersections converted, less idling reduces vehicle emissions, the fuel consumption. Are safer for pedestrians. Pedestrians walk on sidewalks around the perimeter and cross only one direction. Crossing differences are relatively short. The traffic speeds are lower. I didn't talk about pedestrians. So a lot of stuff there. Seat belts, obviously, that's an old one speed. Teenage drivers. Vehicle size and weight has been an issue. A lot of insurance companies are thinking all these SUVs, these are great because they're heavier. They won't get as damaged, but what I discover when you insure an SUV and they hit another car, their car is a lot more damaged. So your liability costs go up. Your property damage goes down because they're not as damaged, but they're getting a lot more damage than drivers. So, there's a lot of stuff here. They have some great videos. Uh, I don't know where the videos are. Somewhere here. They have some really, really great videos. But you, you know, you're probably better off on the videos just finding them on YouTube. They have a lot, a lot of really, really great, great, great videos. C40 recharge site, IS, you know, specifically the Volvos have a reputation for being extremely safe. 
where you see in Volvo, especially, I don't know about this particular room, yes. but is that compartment in front of your legs, and how Volvo puts you there. A few little videos, you may go out and buy a Volvo. Two drivers. Crash test results. Top 10 worst vehicle crash tests. That don't look too good. Um, modern car is another one of those tests. Oh my word. This is a dummy, I think. So, they don't do the dummy courses anymore. Those things are so famous when I was a kid. They, they had the two test dummies that are hilarious commercials. And I think they were pretty effective. Young drivers, the high risk years, all kinds of stuff you can do. So there's a lot there. One I really like, and I'll, I gotta see if it's still available. Um, they talk about the physics of driving, so I'll see some of that. Um, I also think of the Canadians where drivers, they put these four drivers in tests that look really, really quite difficult. So they want to be more active. Um, some of the ones where you have to really concentrate where the wheels on your car are, those look really difficult. So, the drivers on the TV show, they just look horrible. They're messing up so badly, but I don't think they have to do that. Um, all right, so, a lot a lot there that you could definitely do. The paper on, have you all decided on a paper topic yet? Anybody? Now's the time to do it. You have nothing else to do for the next piece of this class. And put the time your topic and get started on and get it out of the way so that you can know, I mean, spring break it's going to be freezing cold for you right if you go down to the coast what you need to sit in your hotel room and write paper you might as well right you might go out and you can't even get weather right it might get warmer in the afternoons but get it out of the way get it started at least pick a topic and go go find a topic that you want to that you want to write about um, so so many choices. Global warming is a big topic. Just a lot of topics. All right. So we're going to get in the commercial insurance. I'll mess you out a little early enough. It's not really that much. Um, now, you took business law about two years ago. A year ago. Business law. Did you take business law? Last semester? Did you have the, the West book still? Massive book is probably online now. Yeah, the West Business Law book, that thing was, it's, it's this big brown book and it's just massive. We had to carry it in our backpacks because we didn't have 15, 20 pounds. That thing was massive. Um, my two classes, that took, we had to take six hours. My two classes, all of the class. Um, it was still a really good class. I had some class. I had plenty of professors, uh, entertaining professors. One guy was like in his, well, I think he was in his 70s or 80s. He's probably in his 40s. Uh, he told me when I was that young. Uh, I would have thought I was in my 70s if that had to be. Interesting guy, lawyer, retired, talked for the fun of it. Um, it's a really important class for insurance. If you want to insurance, you have to understand business law. Uh, I was amazed how much of my business law class I needed in my job. I just assumed lawyers wrote contracts. And then when I started to say discovered, I had to write contracts and the lawyer was a pretty good. Like, you know, a lot of contracts. I've been out of school for a few years. I said, no, they need to write the contract. Because, you know, I'm doing a contract on options or swaps or whatever. Uh, some bank contract. The lawyer doesn't know what I'm doing. He doesn't understand any of that stuff. Because you write what you want, and he adds all the boilerplate language. I assume he's going to review my language. No, he didn't look at any of that. So business law is pretty important. One big part of business law is what we're going to talk about when we get into general liability. negligence and torts. It's not my area of expertise, but I did go through this class of his, and I remember most of it from my business law class. It's really not a lot of new stuff. Um, negligence and torts, we're talking about law when there's no contract involved. It's your responsibility as a member of society. When are you negligent? When are you not negligent? When you can be found liable in court. Yes. Um, now, this applies to your auto and homeowners insurance, but I'm delighted to talk about it on the commercial liability, general liability, because there's just a lot more special cases there. To get into. So I do recommend 
Um, if you've forgotten all your business law, I mean, how, how are your business law professors? So you can do contract law. Oh, requirements for a valid contract. Study the uh, commercial code. Oh, you know the universal commercial code. Oh. Y'all, y'all need this stuff. The UCC. There it is, right there. Uh, What's the difference between tech fraud and uh, PCH fraud? Where you are exposed. Uh, wow, this it's a comprehensive set of laws governing all commercial transactions in the United States. Yes. Another job had UCC. It was now. I was a music major. I don't think it was a part of my music degree. I think when I became, I was both music and accounting. When I had to be accounting, was required. There was very little overlap between music and accounting. So it's hard for me studying all these things hard. I'm sure glad I took business law. So maybe I really highly recommend. How much is this? Well, this is probably my. My account. I don't know. Uh, I don't see the regular price for this. It's probably pretty expensive. Um, it's one of those great courses, and they can be 35, 40 bucks. Go oh, ahead, yeah, average. I would say a good business law. So you need contract law, you need agency law, agency law, if you buy agency law, so agency law, and you need to see um, contract law is very, very important. What's a valid contract? Well, at the end of the semester, we're going to talk about the four requirements of a valid contract. So we'll cover a little bit. Well, negligence and torts, yeah, we're talking about liability. That's what insurance companies insure. When are you liable? When, when are you not? Um, and then UCC is just, if you're going to write contracts, you've got to understand UCC is really involved with who bears the risk. If something goes wrong, who bears the risk? And there's these kind of common law rules that affect that. Uh, I don't know how lengthy of a class is it. I don't see anything about the class in here. So, yeah, I, I found it fairly entertaining too. And it's, it's pretty, you know, my business law case I like class I like because you have you have the law and then you have this case that you go through that usually very, very interesting case. I'll talk about a couple of them, you know, Carol Manette and her lawsuit. Um McDonald's lawsuit, we'll talk about that famous one. I'll talk about some of those that are interesting. So I found it an interesting class. Um, your class doesn't sound so interesting. If it's structure and that sounds kind of boring to me. So I'm glad I put this in here. Um, it's a good, good class. Uh, probably be more interesting than reading the business, the West business law book. I don't know if that's still. Fourteenth edition. It's out there. It's, there it is. Ninety-one bucks. Three hundred books. Bucks. I still recognize that thing. I don't know how many pages it is. Does it say somewhere. Okay. Yeah, you probably get an older edition. Just probably it says it weighs five pounds. It might weigh more than that. Was a week back then. Five pounds is probably a lot for a book. I don't see how many pages it is, but it's, it's a pretty massive, pretty massive book. Um, you can just look at the index and see the topics. We didn't cover the entire book because it was just too massive. Uh, but it goes through the law and then it gives you cases. Everything there's cases all the way through it, so it's, it's, it keeps it pretty, pretty lively. I just have to find how many pages it is. So. I doubt this book would be like on Audible somewhere. That would be pretty, 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 pretty. So 
what we're going to do, we're going to cover commercial property. Commercial property is not that different than homeowners. A lot of similarities. So companies have buildings, like USA has a building. It's damaged. They have hurricane insurance, fire insurance. So we'll talk about that. One unique thing that we're going to cover with commercial that you didn't see with, with personal business loss. So your, your business burns down. You would have had revenue, but because your customers can't come to you, you're going to lose that. So that's going to be covered. Commercial bowl and machinery, it's a very special type of insurance. We'll talk about that separately. It's kind of the special issues there. Commercial crime is a pretty unique to commercial, obviously. Theft. It's unique because the thief, the thief is it an employee or is it a non employee? Um, was it actual theft or did you do an inventory or missing stuff? If you're missing stuff, is that theft or not? What will the insurance company cover? Uh, commercial and marine, you can buy this transportation insurance. You, know, you package your mailing through the postal service that you don't provide insurance. But on the commercial side, we'll talk about that. And then commercial liability, I think that's the last one. So what you're going to discover if you work with any entity, maybe a small school or someone will discover, is they're getting all of this insurance, but it's in one package policy. It may be from three or four different insurance companies, but they have a broker together. So most people don't realize they have five different pieces of insurance. They just see it as one policy they're paying for. We don't have here is workers' comp. We're going to cover workers' comp separately. Workers' comp is usually not part of that package of product. That's something that we want separately. Um, so I'm going to let you go now because I don't want to start right in the middle. So next class, we'll start. With you. All right. So tonight we will leave a little early tonight, but one thing I do want to spend a little bit of time on. You only have really one thing to work on in this class um, for the rest of the semester. And it's the paper two. Sorry, I just the wrong person there. So I really want y'all to pick your topics. So let's start off with who has picked your topic and tell me what it is. Lindy, you got yours? It, it is a good topic. Again, you have to, yeah, you would have to find data. Um, there have been studies on car color. What car color is the safest? Do you want to have any guess on that one? There is one car color that is by far safer than all the others. What? No, in fact, they may be more dangerous. Not blue. They tested it and um, they got a really good test. There's a, a taxi company that had cars of this color and another color, and there was a pretty stark difference in the accident rate between the two. White. Yellow is the color car that has the fewest accidents and is pretty material. And if you start driving and noticing yellow cars, you'll start seeing why. Gray and blue tend to blend in with the color of the streets or with the skies. You don't notice them much. Yellow doesn't blend in with anything. I'm not sure why red doesn't work because you think I drive a red car. You would think red. It might be because people who drive red cars just drive more dangerous to begin with. But, um, but yeah, there are things along those lines. Uh, other things, I don't, I don't know. I mean, if you're going to look at things like uh, the new warning systems and those kind of things, you know, those should have a connection. Try see if you can find articles. So what you need to do is find at least one really meaty article. So this is not a research paper. You're not going to come back. You don't have to go out and find 30, 40 different sources. One really meaty, meaty article that's maybe you know 10 pages long or something that can work are three pretty decent articles, two or three pages each that can work on the topic. It doesn't have to be an article though. If you could find a really good documentary, you could use that as your, as your backup. That's why I say the Institute for Highway Safety can be a good place to go where they'll have stuff like that. 
So it doesn't necessarily YouTube, you know, everything's on YouTube. Um, so make sure you have the data that you can do a pretty, pretty decent case. I had one student do a, a case on uh, insuring the, uh, the scooters because, you know, scooters go around knocking people off, hot, off sidewalks, injuring them and all that. He didn't have much to work with. So it did not turn out to be a very good strong paper because it just wasn't enough stuff. He kind of got disappointed as he got into it. All right, somebody else. I need topics. Uh, I was thinking about doing uh, blockchain to put on oh, wow. blockchain. Do you, is there stuff out there on that? Um, I, I've seen a few videos. What's the yeah. angle? Um, it could limit, it could reduce administrative and underwriting costs. And, uh, and so that can lower, that can, that can get it into markets that are usually a little too, their margins are a little too low for them to be profitable. Do you have articles that are pretty substantive or are you still? Um, I mean, I haven't looked at them for like a couple of weeks, but uh, there was some All right. Yeah, I'd be worried about finding uh, out there. If you type blockchain, 70 million things come up. Make sure it's uh, one thing they really, really care. Wow, blockchain and title insurance. That's pretty. Now that, that would be interesting. Um, this class hasn't talked about title insurance. We, we, um, boy, that's, that's interesting. I could definitely see that. There's, uh, I'm a, probably going to step on toes. I'm very anti-title insurance. I really don't like that industry at all. Um, <clears throat> I'm dealing with the title and title company now. I actually, what they're doing on their research is really good. I don't like the title insurance itself. Uh, I might show you all some numbers. Um, title, USA, all state, state farm don't sell title insurance. I wish they did. <laughs> In fact, I think they would almost give it away for free if they did. Um, it's extremely expensive insurance. And there are some really good articles arguing that title insurance should be deregulated, allow insurance companies. But blockchain could definitely, you know, you need something that has proof of ownership. Blockchain is makes a lot of sense that that would be a good way to do it. So, um, you know, so you might think, like, you know, from that standpoint, there, there might be some really definitive so there's an article right there that would be pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, article on blockchains might 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 work um, if you can find enough stuff. I'm not sure about blockchain and auto insurance. How blockchain is transforming the the industry? What industry? So I don't want an article on blockchain changing the, the insurance industry. So it needs to really be specifically to property and casualty. So I, I was reading one article on, it was on drought insurance. And All kind of insurance? Drought. Drought, okay. So that would count. I mean, that's not, you know, we're not going to talk too much about farmers and drought kind of insurance. As long as it's sold by the property casualty insurance industry, I will throw in title insurance. That's kind of its own field, but that really falls under uh, uh, property casualty insurance to be sure. Um, for years, traditional insurance model has proven to be surprisingly resilient. However, traditional insurance is beginning to feel the digital effect as emerging technology changes the way consumers interact. One of those is blockchains. So, okay, there might be stuff there. Just make sure it's specific to the industry. It can't be something that would apply to Walmart and you know other companies as well. It's got to be really specific to the industry. Uh, I had one student do a paper on title insurance. I think it's pretty fascinating. You'll, you'll find quite a bit of stuff out there. The industry argues they add a tremendous amount of value, but they're talking about the, the title search. My argument is not the title search. My argument is the title insurance itself. That I think is grossly overcharged. Why do I think that? Well, because there are a lot, you remember loss ratio? Loss is divided by premiums. You remember you usually see that around 70, 80%. For title insurance, their loss ratios are like 5%. You pay $100 in premium on average, they pay out $5 in claims. 
So it's it's you know it's there's very there's very little frequency and severity. They very hardly ever pay a claim. So it's a very very low cost to them insurance. I think that industry could be disrupted if you let State Farm and Allstate actually sell that insurance. As others, I want y'all to pick your topic tonight. You should have been thinking about something by now. We've been talking so many topics in class. Somebody else, give me a topic. Point two. Yeah, if you say reinsurance, there are, you know, what's the angle going to be there? Um, that's why I say going to a place like Swiss Re's site and see what reinsurers are talking about. Uh, be careful on reinsurers because they do life and PNC. So if you want to do reinsurance, there are top five issues. I, a paper like that would be fine. What are, the, what are the top five things reinsurance companies are most worried about today? That could be a, a topic. Um, and there you could go to the biggest players, Munich Re, Gen Re, Swiss Re, and just look. They, they all have, well, I don't know about Gen Re, but Munich Re and Swiss Re will definitely have a research portal. Although some of the things they're most talking about today, blockchain may be, that may, you might go to Swiss Re and look at blockchain. You might see what they're saying. Um, it might not just be how it's transforming the industry. It might also be the question of, can the insurance industry insure blockchain? You know, you've talked, heard about these fraudulent people still, you know, can the insurance industry actually ensure that that might, that might be a topic, I guess. Uh, uh, blockchain, can you ensure cryptocurrency? Can you insure Bitcoin? Lloyd launches new cryptocurrency wallet insurance. There you go right there. <laughs> Lloyd says launched a new insurance policy to protect cryptocurrency health and online wallets against theft or other malicious attacks. Boy, so you just talking topics things just come to you. That would be a great topic as well. Okay, so I think there's enough there, Mitchell. <laughs> I, I give in. I concede. Uh, the fact that Lloyd's is doing that, Lloyd's is you know they're the biggest players. They're the one that do the unusual things. Uh -huh. Oh, lo siento. No, boy, y'all should. But it's on the, um, it'd be on the Zoom. All right, so yeah, there, there's a topic right there. Um, so yeah, I found a few, yeah, it's gonna take it a while to get up there. That's the other thing to think about is what's going on new today that hasn't been the case. So what's the impact of electronic vehicles on auto insurance? Maybe nothing, maybe an enormous amount. How do you find that out? Auto insurance and EVs. Having how having an electronic car affects your auto insurance rates. Is there enough there for a paper? I don't know, but it's out there. There's 122 million results in that search. So here's here's the first article I was showing y'all. Insurance disruption: How blockchain is transforming the industry. Lloyd's has launched a new insurance policy to protect cryptocurrency held online. How having an electric car affects your auto insurance rates. Car insurance for electric vehicles is about 23% more expensive than equivalent. Why is that? That would be that would be interesting to figure out. Um, why is there a difference? One major factor is maybe that the cost of vehicles are higher. Electric vehicles tend to be filled with cutting edge technology. That's been the argument for autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles have all these cameras and all this kind of stuff, so the insurance gets to be more expensive. I think that's the wrong debate uh, for uh, autonomous vehicles. And the reason for that is, and I actually gave you an article out there, if you, if you really want to get into autonomous vehicles, I actually gave you article. Here's one. I have an economist article on cyber risk. Uh, if you're interested in cyber security and those type of issues, that's a huge issue for insurance. Um, well, I had, I had an economist article on 
autonomous vehicles, but I don't know where I put it. Oh, there it is, driverless car article. I call, I call them driverless cars, but they're autonomous vehicles now. It's actually several articles. There's plenty, you, if you did auto insurance and driverless vehicles or autonomous vehicles, there's a lot of stuff out there that you can reference. These articles I have here are pretty, pretty old, but here's where I disagree with the insurance industry. The insurance industry says it may actually help us because the car is going to be more expensive, so I'll make more premium. My argument is it may eliminate the need for car ownership. And if that's the case, it's going to destroy the industry, destroy the banking industry as well with auto loans. So if people stop buying cars and they instead get a, an autonomous uh, Uber, which could happen you know, at least for the second car, if you cut cars in half, you know, I think the average house in the US has what, 1.4 cars or something like that. If you bring that down to 0.9, that's a huge impact on the auto insurance industry. But you can see I've given you some research here, but you can definitely find more up to date. Um, it's pretty funny to say, while well, driverless cars could be on road by 2020, so they missed that by a few years. Um, but there's a lot in there that's just, just saying the impact on uh, accident rates, the impact on parking and how much parking we have to put downtown, um, you know, just on pollution, all kinds of things. Um, some people say for the, auto in, for the auto industry, it may not be all that bad because if we have autonomous vehicles, instead of cars sitting in a driveway 98% of the time, you have fewer cars, but they're being driven almost 100% of the time. So cars wear out a lot faster. We just don't buy as many of them, but the term's going to be, you know, so you have cars over the last two years, but we only buy 20% as many cars as we did in fact, you know, you have to do the math. Uh, but they say cars are among the most expensive things people own, and yet they sit idle 96% of the time. Google rec reckons that shared self-driving ta taxis could be 75% cheaper than they are today. And perhaps just 30% of the cars that we have today would actually be on the road. Um, if I were writing a paper like this, I would write it from the standpoint of I'm advising USA on their future. And what could this mean for their future auto insurance since that's a big chunk of their premiums? Huh? Is there going to be a certain rubric that we have to follow? No, you have to come up with your own rubric because every every topic is different. Yeah. Okay, so I'm thinking of uh, dash funds and insurance fraud, and I'm thinking about the lower uh, premiums for everybody and more people would use them. Yeah, I think dash cams would be really, really good. You're Christina, right? I think. Um, so, yeah, I I would think that would be a great great one. I've I've been thinking about getting getting one. How many of y'all have a dash cam? How many y'all have? I, boy, I've thought about it a lot. It's um, insurance fraud. You've seen the uh, insurance frauds where the people you know jump on the hood kind of thing, and and all all they do afterwards is the person in the car points to their dash cam and the guy runs off. Um, how dash cam can lower insurance costs, how dash cams impact your auto insurance. You know, I, I don't think you'd have too much trouble finding, finding that. Now, if you buy a dash cam where your insurance rates come down, it'd be interesting to see, you know, if you actually call your insurance, have a dash cam now. But that's part of it. It, sure, it should help the insurance industry address those liability claims, but how material is it? You should have articles to say that. Yeah, Christine, I think that would be very easy to research and quite, quite interesting as well. Will that matter? Consumer Reports has one. There's a good article right there. There currently aren't any insurers who use US that will give you a discount for having a dash cam. This was written in 2021. But there's a pretty meaty article. Well, not uh, not too meaty. So you need a little bit more than that, but interesting, interesting article. All right, we got three down, four down. What, besides the dash cam, every time I ride my bike by this one house, the first time I was like, what am I hearing? But this computer says, you are now being filmed. And I thought, boy, that's kind of weird. So it could be 
Yeah, I say auto insurance, Christina, you could expand it out to even dash cams on houses and what that's doing. So, you know, or maybe home as well, if you wanted to, there certainly could be, they give you a little bit more to think, think through. What else are y'all doing? I do want to know your topic. I'm not going to necessarily say two people can't do the same topic, topic but I prefer two people not do the same topic. Um, huh? So it's not something you're asking to do, but I'd be interested to see someone do like a case study on like a really weird type of insurance. Like I know some uh, musicians will insure their hands or stuff like that. So just like a case study of why that's difficult. Or... Yeah, and some of these more interesting ones are more on the life insurance side. So pet insurance has become really, really popular. But um, alien abduction insurance, and if you want to get really, <laughs> how do you say abduction? Abduction. It does exist. You can buy it. Um, there's unusual insurance policy. So there's an article right there on that. Alien abduction, werewolf, Vanguard goes ransom reimbursement. Now, re ransom reimbursement that's an actually pretty legitimate one. Food truck insurance, celebrities, and other irreplaceable talent that's probably what you're talking about there. A Dutch winemaker's nose, Gene Simmons. I forget who that is. Basis of the 70 insert his tongue. So, there, there probably could be some there. You'd have to, you know, really look at everything you could find. Um, I don't know how much. I don't know if it's like if regulators actually regulate alien abduction insurance. I, would, I think they would consider it to be somewhat fraudulent. Um, I don't know what alien life insurance means. That's kind of Lloyds of London alien abduction. I can't imagine that they would offer that. They're not necessarily known for that kind of six of the strangest insurance policies ever and 10 extras. Yeah, I think. Um, I'm always amazed what you can find from, from Google. It's hard to think of a topic that you can't can't find. What else are y'all doing? So I want you to send me your topic uh, before next class. What you're gonna do? So I, I decided to do the rock and belt. Uh, okay. I've got uh, 240 page essay. How long? Uh, information topic. How many pages was it? How many pages was it? Okay. All right. So that's a little long, but yeah, certainly there's enough research. That one's to me a really, really interesting one. I'd love to see the statistics, the statistics on that one, um, and see how reliable they are. And if it's you know just the U.S. or everywhere, I get the sense that it started in Europe. And has come to the U.S. Um, that's just my sense of you know visiting other countries that you notice them more in other countries, not just in the big you know France. Paris has that real major one around the Arc or the Water Triumph. Um, you know, I notice it there. But even just out in the country, you know, even I've I've seen more here in the U.S. You're out in these country roads, and there's a a shift, and they'll do a roundabout there in the middle of nowhere. We usually in the U.S. think a roundabout is like when three streets come together or something, but they have them just two, and it makes sense out in the country because that's where people are just going 80 miles an hour and not even looking, and you just randomly have two people and that roundabout really slows them down. So yeah, I imagine it's pretty interesting. Other ones. So my next class, I want now. If you change your mind, you can change your mind. You just have to let me know. So you know if y'all think of something else, and Jacob, you got to get yours a little bit more refined than that. Um, if you send me a topic and I don't think it's gonna go, I'll, I'll let you know. So it uh, can't be too too generic, can't be something that can apply to almost any industry. You need to get it, you know, so Mitchell, you gotta get yours really specific to the insurance industry. Um, uh -huh. Moving down for electric vehicle insurance. Okay. You can change it, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there should be plenty of articles. It's just definitely, you know, the in, in insurance industry, when there's a major shift like that, like they saw a shift in SUVs, they write a lot of papers. Actuaries are research people. They just naturally write papers. 
and they like to share it with each other, even though there's always this concern about collusion on pricing. Actuaries tend to share everything because that's just kind of nature of their research. So you should be able to find plenty of articles on that, I think. All right, so you have in the class notes some examples as well. Um, this is an article, but it's it's definitely the topics in it are still quite interesting. Um, at the time this article was, was written, they're asking about how many insurance companies. And so if you did, all, no, I don't think anyone's asked for autonomous vehicles, but if you did autonomous vehicles, you could actually go out and see what insurance companies are saying in their annual report about it. So Darian, that's something you might try, you know, go to Allstate and search on electronic vehicles and see if they're actually putting any kind of footnote in their, finance, in their financial annual report on that. That would be interesting. Same thing with autonomous vehicles. Um, same thing on blockchain, you know, just go into an annual report of a major player and just ask the question, what are they, what are they saying in your report? Because if this is going to disrupt the industry, they have to talk about it in your report. So at the time this article is written, which this is a fairly old article, three big auto in American insurers noted in their SEC filings that driverless cars threaten to disrupt their business. So there are some putting that first. Um, and you'll see this a lot, 94% of accidents are due to human error. I don't know how they know that. <laughs> how do they know an accident is human error or not? Driverless cars cannot drink alcohol, break the speed limit, or get distracted by a text message. The number of accidents would fall from five and a half million a year to 1.3 million, and road deaths from 32,400 to 11,300. That's a very, very round number for a complete guess. Once self-driving vehicles become available, some places will probably ban ordinary cars. I actually have my own opinion about this. I think what you're gonna notice is we're gonna start building infrastructure for AVs. So instead of AVs trying to compete with human drivers, we're gonna, I think we're gonna start seeing, instead of the HOV lane, we're gonna start seeing the AV lane. Um, I think AVs will do much, much better if they have their own, their own stuff if they're not interacting with pedestrians and other cars. And especially if I'm gonna to drive to Dallas, well, I'd love to get in the car at 11 p.m., climb in bed with my pillow and my Wi-Fi and just go to bed and sleep for six hours while it drives me to Dallas. And when it gets to Dallas, it just parks someplace nice and safe. And I just, at 6 a.m., I get up and ready to go. That would be wonderful. I'd feel much safer about that if it was on my own own lane. So, you know, some of these toll, toll, toll roads would be perfect for that kind of thing. Maybe when I get into Dallas, that car that I just used now becomes a human driven car and I drive in the city. I don't know. And, you know, there's who knows how this will work out. Um, but I, I, I do think it can work a whole lot better. Um, they talk a lot about parking spaces and those kind of things. There were, there were cars drop you off downtown and they drive back and you don't need parking space. So there's a, there's a lot of factors in here. Um, so these articles are old, so you'll find something much more valuable than that. I just clicked on some ones because The Economist had a series of articles on, on, on these. Our makers increasingly fret that the industry is on the brink of huge disruption. But again, this was back in 2016, five years ago. All of them, all the major manufacturers have an, an autonomous vehicle and an EV vehicle. Um, uh, electronic vehicle component, major part of their business. Um, uh -huh. Well, they get the statistics that um, there's very few accidents. Now, th this data has changed dramatically because we've had We've had the Tesla death and we've had Google, I don't know if it was a death, but a pretty bad crash. Google's whose cars have gone 1.3 million test miles. Once, pro uh, once promised 2018 when this is gonna happen. Um, yeah, they have the data, I don't think it's in here, um, but they tell you the data. Of all the miles that Google has done, they've had very, very few accidents, even post those accidents. To me, the Tesla one, well, a couple of Tesla ones were people who were supposed to be paying attention weren't. 
But the lady that got hit, y'all probably heard that, the autonomous vehicle that, that killed the pedestrian, if y'all remember that one. Um, part of that was really her fault. I mean, she was, I mean, not the, any disrespect of that person, but uh, she was doing something she shouldn't have been done, doing, and she could have easily, just as easily got hit by a driver car because of the way she was, she was uh, conducting herself. But the AV got confused because she was in a place you don't normally expect a pedestrian and, and kind of confused. And autonomous vehicles don't know the difference between a paper bag blowing across the street or a plastic bag going across the street and a baby in a stroller, but it's gonna get smarter. And that's what I love about autonomous vehicles. If I do something stupid in my car, the rest of the world doesn't start driving better. If an autonomous vehicle does something stupid, every other autonomous vehicle suddenly gets smarter and drives better. That's the huge advantage of artificial intelligence is suddenly we're learning and everybody in the entire world learns immediately. The downside is someone can hack in to some software and we all become dead all at the same time. So there's, there's pros and cons of that. I do think uh, the, the driver, the truck, the truck industry, trucking industry has a strong incentive to get the autonomous vehicles because they're losing drivers left and right. There's just not enough truck, truck drivers out there. Uh, and I can see it, you know, one thing that really helped with trucking, if trucks could drive 60 instead of 70 or 55, you save gasoline, but they can drive seven by 24. They're much safer. You give them their own lanes. I, I just, I could see that would be pretty impressive, right? We give highway lanes just for uh, autonomous truckers. That would be great for the entire economy. There's a lot of trucks that kill a lot of people. Um, and, you know, I, you could cut that down dramatically. Um, so I, I do think in the trucking industry, that is, there's definitely people, there are trucking industry that are pushing really hard to move that ahead. They have an incentive. When you see those kind of incentives uh, with the numbers behind it, I, I do think there's a push. It's going to be pretty sad if we don't get to that point because there's so much money being poured into it. And you got, I think what excites me is it's not Ford and Tesla and GM. It's also Apple and Google and Amazon. <laughs> and trucking companies, there's a lot of people with a lot of money pushing this. If it doesn't work, there's going to be a lot of wasted money on this. So why does Google want autonomous vehicles? Because they want you texting while you're driving, because you spend a lot of time in the car. They want you shopping while you're driving. And this is their, their way of getting that around there. So anyway, several articles. So right there, I'll give you a good sense of what a good amount of research you would need to get a good article on this. There's plenty, you know, that's, that's 21 pages of articles right there. Very easy to find because there's so much of that stuff out there. All right, so by, by our next class, on next Tuesday, when we get back, I want everybody here uh, to have given me their topic. I don't want you picking a topic two days before the papers do and give me some mediocre thrown together paper because that bores the life out of me. And I can tell, I can always tell I want a good meaty paper that you've thought about. Plus, if you pick your topic now, you might see some great documentary on PBS, or you might see some great article in Business Week on your topic, and you just saved yourself a lot of extra research time. There it is right there. All right, you can change your mind, but um, great that you have your topic. All right. So we're doing commercial insurance. Let's get a little bit of this out of the way. We'll go another 14 minutes. Again, if you're here tonight, you're getting double attendance. So that's kind of nice, unless you leave early. So you got to stay another 14 minutes. Um, so insurance, I showed you all the packaged policies that they have. Most companies, I've been shocked some of the entities I deal with have every single one of those. There's one entity I volunteer with and they had Boulder and Machine. I was like, why do we have Boulder? machinery. What do we have in this building that would fit under that? But we had it as part of it. So commercial property was probably one of the biggest ones we're worried about. If our building burns down, what are we going to do? It has very similar to homeowners where it has the different forms. It also has personal property, but here the personal property, you know, it's uh, a little bit different because you have employees, you have customers, it's like, what are you covering? What are you not covering? So it gets a little bit confusing there. It has the same type of, of, of breakouts between build, buildings and other buildings and all that kind of thing. Is the personal property of the insured 
or is it personal property of other people's? And since, you know, unlike your house, you don't have a lot of strangers walking to your house with their stuff versus a business that does. So that's the distinction for homeowners. The stuff that's not covered, very, very similar to what we saw with homeowners. You do see some unusual things like you know, crops. I know absolutely nothing about farm insurance. So if you want to, I want to write a paper on farm insurance. Maybe you have a farming memory family that's a farmer. That would be really interesting to me. You could do some analysis and get some text. I'm, I'm sure you could find really good, good articles on farm insurance. My, uh, my neighbor's dogs sold surprise sheep across the street. Oh, wow. And it was thousands of dollars insurance they had to Oh. Crop and livestock insurance, USDA. So I'm sure there's a lot you can do there. I don't know what the issues there are. And that's where the, the drought insurance comes in. That's where the federal government comes in a lot of times and has, because a lot of time farm insurance is a lot like flood insurance, where if, if one farm is being devastated, probably they all are. So it's maybe too big for the insurance industry to handle. But I don't know that that. I've never worked for a company that sold farm insurance. It tends to be fairly specialized. The rest of the stuff is very, very similar to, to, to homeowners. Exclusions, very similar to homeowners. One special case for, for this industry is pollution. And you'll notice pollution, especially in San Antonio. Why do you think pollution in San Antonio is such a hot topic? What's the main thing people are worried about? What's the one thing as a business you don't want to pollute in San Antonio? Edwards Aquifer. <laughs> Have y'all been over to uh, La Cantera and seen those pollution ponds that they have? I mean, that's pretty dangerous. You have this massive parking lot over Edwards Aquifer. All this oil, gasoline, the rain is going to pour that right into Edwards Aquifer. That's a huge issue. And La Cantera doesn't want to be the one that pollutes the Edwards Aquifer. Huge issue in San Antonio. That is a special type of insurance. You have to get special coverage for that. I don't know about your homeowner's insurance. If your house would somehow were to pollute the Edwards Aquifer, I don't know what your coverage would be for that, for the liability and for the property damage. But for businesses, it's a huge issue. USAA, it's a huge issue. That's a big, big, big building, a lot of cars, a lot of parking over the Edwards Aquifer. So, um, and the co-insurance is very, very similar to homeowners. It's just slightly different. Whereas where, where does the, the parentheses go on the deductible. That's the only thing that's a little bit different, but that's not important to us. So essentially it's the same with a couple of things with crops and pollution that you have to watch out for. Business income is very unique to, uh, to the commercial side. If your business goes down because of a covered peril, again, it has to be a covered peril, a fire, wind, something like that, and you can't do business, you're losing, you're losing revenue. So you have reduction in income or you have increases in expenses. So I work with a private school, or you see, we shut our private school down. We're so glad we did because we shut it down the year before COVID. And I was telling the principal, I said, I bet you're glad you didn't have to deal with COVID and shut down a private school when we didn't. But we always ask the question, what happens if we cannot get in this building and we have, we have to move across the street or somewhere. And that's what they kept telling me. We're, you know, there's a mall across the street. We'll just move all our classes over there. So I asked them, have you actually ever called that mall and asked them, could you actually rent space there on a contingency basis? We should at least have that conversation. So if you deal with an entity like this and they're assuming if we go down, we're gonna move here, you need to go test that. Ask that question, can you actually move over there? But what this insurance would do is if we could not, let's say we had some, some contamination or a fire or some kind of some, something, a, a, a pipe burst, we can't get in the building. Um, this policy would pay that rent to move across the street. Or if you had to shut down and you weren't getting tuition, it would reimburse you for that tuition. Um, so you always want to ask those questions. Where could you go? Uh, you essentially want to look at your net income before the loss, after the loss, and it's going to make you whole on those two. Um, mm -hmm. All right, I'll let you read those sections. Um, there are other kind of coverages that are kind of sec secondary. 
Um, time is important here. How long is it going to take you to get back up and running? Probably depends on the type of loss that you have. Um, you're losing customers. You might lose some customers permanently. There is a limit to this coverage. So once you hit your limits, you're done. You can't get any more. Um, you might lose your license, your leases, your contracts, those kind of things. When during the year you're disrupted, you know, if you're a retail and you get disrupted during December, that's a much bigger impact than you're disrupted, say in May or something, or maybe June. Um, it has extra expenses during the restoration period, um, expenses to avoid or memorize suspension of business, expenses incurred to memorize suspension of business insured cannot continue operations, expenses for repairing, you know, if you can't continue your operations, but you, you're under contract to keep paying your teachers, that's an additional expense that you have. Um, so it has all these different pieces we're looking at. But well, some people said this is getting too complicated. We have all these distinctions that we're making. Let's do what we call a value policy. What it says is, hey, if you're down and you can't run, we're going to pay you $50,000 a week or a day until you're back up and running. So it's just it's kind of like life insurance. It says we don't care what caused the loss. We don't care if it's more expensive, if it's lost income. We're just going to pay you this much money until you're back up and running. Makes it much, much, much simpler. Um, what I like about these policies is the entities that I volunteer with, I actually take advantage of these policies, sit down with a broker, and I go through scenarios with the broker. Because the brokers are usually pretty knowledgeable because they handle claims. So I don't know if y'all ever volunteer with a school or if you're on a board somewhere, and you have these policies. Once a year, these things come with renewal. What most of them do is the broker just comes in and says, here's a new policy, it's 10% more. Thank you very much. And what I did with some of the MI entities is, no, I want to be in on that meeting. I want to sit down with them. This is your broker. You're paying them money. I want to go through these policies. I want to say, hey, what happens if we burn down, if our school burns down? What will we do? What's going to be paid? Where do we go? I'm taking advantage of this person who's supposedly an expert in the field and going through each one of these kind of things. Same thing with workers' comp. What if one of our teachers, we actually had this happen, one of our teachers slipped and fell and she really broke her leg badly. We had a workers' comp claim. I want to go through that scenario in advance. I want to understand how all of that works. And this is the one I spent the most time on. They kept saying, well, assume we can move over here. Well, I don't want you to assume. I want you to make a phone call. And let's figure that out. Commercial boiler machinery. When I see that in the policy, I then ask the broker, what do we have? This is specialized insurance. So if you're an actuary, you do this. This is probably all you're going to do your entire career because you're going to be somewhat typecast as a boiler machine boiler, commercial boiler and machinery actuary. Because very few insurers actually insure this. It's very specialized. This is probably the AIGs of the world. Uh, maybe the chubs, um, very few insure this. It's also known as breakdown insurance because it's one of those that it's, it actually insures for stuff that normal insurance wouldn't insure for. It, it covers losses resulting from accidental breakdown of objects falling under description of commercial boiler and machine, um, but only for those perils that are covered. So it tends to be not all risk, but only listed risk. Um, these are unique things. And some of these, I don't even know what they are. So that's why I asked, why are we, why do we, why are we pay for this insurance? So a steam boiler, I don't know what that is. Air tanks, I think I might know what that is. I know what compressors are, but I don't know what, I don't know, if, you know, we're talking about the air conditioner or whatever there. I have no idea what that is. And Bill Gates doesn't even know what that is. Furnaces, kettles, mango rolls, refrigerating systems. We have refrigerators, but I don't know if that's a refrigerating system. Steam pipelines. So I'm looking at that list and going, why are we paying you know, $300 a year for this insurance? What exactly do we own in this building? Um, a lot of times it's operator error. And so what this insurance does that's really helpful is they, be, they come in and they help you manage the loss help you avoid these losses. So their expertise, and in fact, if you don't follow their directions, they can stop insuring you and saying you're no longer insured because you don't have these policies in place. Um, 
So they have the right to stop. Um, it covers the cost of repairing and replacing your product with no deduction. It may also cause consequential damages like spoilage of good food. Um, so they come in, they help you. The, the company can view the insurance as part of your loss control. So you're actually getting some value out of this insurance. They're coming in and helping you reduce the chances of loss, but they're coming in and helping you include the, the suspension provision. Hey, if you don't do what we tell you, you're no longer covered until you start doing that. So it's very unique insurance. I don't know any insurance. I've never worked for a company that's covered that, but I find it pretty interesting. All right, so I'm gonna let you leave from here. We'll start here at next class and we'll finish up commercial insurance. But then we're gonna get into the special topics like asbestos, professional liability, tort. So we're gonna get into some kind of entertaining topics there at the end. All right, have a good spring break.